We now look at some of the loose ends uh, in terms of uh, project evaluation and investment returns calculation for uh, for the projects and try and uh, tighten those loose ends as we go along. We also look at the problems that come ahead with uh, the using of uh, IRR or NPV as a rule and how do we uh, kind of keep that in mind and how do we take care of these uh, these issues that crop up from time to time, right? So. Uh, we are now towards the last portion of this uh, unit and we're going to discuss this unit uh, in terms of uh, its totality here. So far, what we have seen projects is that it's an independent project that the company has to take, right? Now, in real life, that is seldom the case. Very rarely does that happen. Most often, the firm has to choose between variety of projects. These projects are thus known as mutually exclusive projects because uh, you know you know either due to the lack of resources to be able to take more than one project or lack of need of two or three projects at the same time. So firms typically choose one out of many projects. When firms choose one out of many project, this is a matter of choice and the choice is going to depend on some sort of a rule. Whether we use NPV as a rule or we use IRR as a rule or we use something else as a rule, it becomes important for us to, however, understand where does what rule work and where does what rule not work, right? So that's the important uh, understanding that we have when we are looking at mutually exclusive projects. Mutually exclusive projects would be projects where you would choose one at the expense of the other, right? Now, what do you uh, what do you do if you have mutually exclusive projects and when you are comparing them? So, I you could you could ideally look at the return on equity or return on capital of the projects and pick the one with the highest return on capital, the one we used with uh, with respect to uh, the accounting earnings, and uh, try and find out whichever one of those has the highest accounting earnings. We use that and we kind of go ahead with that analysis. We could look at the NPV of projects which will work on cash flows and pick the one with the highest NPV or we could look at the IRR of the projects and pick one, one pick the one with the highest IRR right now note IRR is basically the maximum rate at which you can raise capital so that the project is still profitable right if the hurdle rate or cost of capital is greater than IRR then you reject the project right so remember irr is the is the highest rate at which you can borrow the money for for a project and the project still becoming viable which basically means the higher the irr the more uh, your chances of taking the project because you could you could borrow money even at a higher rate and take that project right now while most of the times the npv and irr give the same you know weightage and same analysis of the project in different projects they could sometimes select different projects. Now, there are some rare cases when you're comparing two projects and one of the project ranks higher on the NPV rule and another one ranks higher on the IRR rule. Now, in these cases, how do we go about dealing with, uh, with the scenarios and the issues is what is going to be the crux of this discussion, right? Let's take uh, the example of uh, of a project that has this set of cash flows in year 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4, right? The first chunk that we see is that this is a non-conventional or unconventional cash flow. Why? Is because it starts with a negative cash flow. Typically, your, uh, your conventional cash flows are negative cash flow and then you have positive, positive, positive all the way through. The moment there is another negative cash flow, that's an unconventional or non-conventional cash flow, right? Let's try and calculate the IRR for this kind of a cash flow. So let's go to our Excel file for this and let's try and calculate the IRR for this set of cash flows. Remember, these are the years we are looking at and these are the cash flows. So if I were to calculate the IRR here, I just do a simple IRR calculation, put all these values in the formula and we get a rate of around 6.60%, correct? Now there is a trick here. There's an interesting thing we are going to try is we're going to do another IRR formula. And if you note carefully, the formula 
let's open the formula for IRR it takes values which we will select from here there's something else called guess right now guess is the number that you guess is close to the result of the IRR right so 0.1 if uh, if 10% uh, is the number now let's take a guess that the IRR of the project is 30% right when I write that and I click on that it gives me an IRR of 36.55% now that's interesting because it is giving me two IRRs for the same project right basically it means that at 6.6% the NPV will become zero and at 36.55% the NPV will become zero we can try that so if we calculate the NPV at 6.6% for this set of cash flows fair enough that's zero and if we calculate the NPV at this rate for 36.6% rate for the same set of cash flows let's let's select the cash flows sorry I think there's a there's an error we have done NPV rate comma and the same set of cash flows we get zero so it seems the IRR is correct in both the cases and there are two IRRs that this this uh, project has now what we do here is we calculate NPV at various discount rates just to calculate just to kind of look at a plot for the NPV of this kind of a project and we realize that there are two IRRs between 6.6 .6 and 36.6 percent the NPV of the project is positive if the if the discount rate is less than 6.6 percent or more than 36.6 percent the NPV turns negative right now what do we do do we choose this project over and above another project so the reality is that the moment we look at an unconventional cash flow there is going to be an issue in terms of calculating the IRR because there will be multiple IRRs that are available in the case of multiple IRRs being available it is always a good idea to focus purely on the NPV rule just use the NPV rule and work with that if the NPV is positive go ahead with the project if it is not do not if you're selecting two of these projects again select the one with a higher NPV at a given discount rate right this basically suggests this isn't this is an interesting case set of cash flows because the sign of the cash flow changes twice right so if someone were to ask you how many IRRs can a series of cash flows have that answer would appear here is that the number of IRRs a project can have is the number of times the cash flow changes signs here we have the change of cash flow the sign change happening once and then twice so we can have two IRRs this is the IRR and this is the IRR correct and so this is an interesting kind of a project in real life you don't find too many of these uh, but mathematically speaking you can find you can find this and hence you have to be careful with evaluating projects with multiple IRRs if you have a project with multiple IRR in general use the NPV rule fair enough that's one now let's look at two more projects and uh, let's try and figure out which one we would pick it appears that project B is a larger project and project A is a smaller project because project A is using about 10 lakh rupees and project B is using about 1 crore rupees right or 1 million and 10 million rupees and the set of cash flows are also about 10 times in project B as compared to project A now when we kind of extend our analysis in terms of NPV and IRR we will realize that NPV of project A is 478.162 and project B is 2,011,673 rupees right assuming a rate hurdle rate of 12% that's what we have assumed the IRR however is 32% for project A and 21% for project B so what do we find we find NPV of A is less than NPV of B and we find that IRR of A is greater than IRR of B now that's where the problem compounds itself because now what do we choose right and within this one single example lies the construct of where NPV becomes important where IRR becomes important and how some firms use certain rules more than the other rules as we are looking at right now we will realize that the first issue that comes is NPV 
is a sort of an absolute metric which means it gives us a rupee value of the project right in rupee terms how much money you will make IRR is a sort of a relative metric and it gives us a percentage value of money that can be made essentially in a sense right so it's obvious that for larger projects like project B NPV will be higher correct NPV will be higher and for smaller projects like project A NPV will be smaller it is also most likely going to happen that for smaller projects like A IRR will be higher they might give you more money per rupee invested than uh, than the larger projects right now so in itself it starts giving you an indication on how do you select these projects now if you're selecting these two projects there is a problem in terms of how do you select project A and project B let's say we select project A if we select project A then let's assume we have this 1 crore or 10 million of capital available so we have used 1 million how much is left idle 9 million is still idle we have not used this 9 million right the risk we entail is that no other project comes across that gives us any money and this 9 million stays idle so I make money only on part of my project part of my capital which is uh, 1 million the remaining 9 million lies idle if I choose project A correct if on the other hand I choose project B the risk we entail is that we have used up all our capital and then other projects come up during this period which give us a better return on capital but we have no money left to invest right so the choices change depending on how much money do I have right so the choices change on availability of money Correct. The choices would depend on availability of projects. Correct. If I have a large chunk of projects who are which are expected to come up, then I would probably choose the smaller one right now and wait for more projects to come up. If I don't have a large number of projects, I'll choose the bigger one. Correct. If availability of money is a concern, then I will probably choose the smaller one. If there is no dearth of capital there is no scarcity of capital I have enough capital as much capital as I want at all points of time I will use uh, project B correct so for all practical purposes what we are saying is that uh, the dependence on what project you choose is going to come from the fact that whether there is capital rationing or not so if there is limited capital correct if there is limited capital and there are many projects at hand then firms tend to use the IRR rule typically you will find that smaller high growth companies would fit this bill because they have less capital and they have many projects because they're growing fast and there is a possibility of picking any project that is uh, that is possibly going to give them better results so they can't commit all their money into one single project if however there is large amount of capital available and no real issue with raising more more money and less projects available then the firm would likely use NPV as a method what project gives me a bigger rupee value at the end of the day what absolute size the project creates for me is what I'm going to select so large publicly listed companies are likely to use this why because they have no dearth of capital access these are large firms they can always borrow money they can always issue more shares and get more money there and uh, typically because these are in public domain the projects available to them are also kind of clearly defined there aren't too many that are uh, that are essentially available at any given point of time so practically if there is large amounts of capital available companies would tend to kind of use the NPV rule if there are smaller amounts of capital there is capital rationing and there are many projects at hand high growth smaller companies tend to use IRR rule right if you were to technically choose one of these at the end of it we will realize NPV is probably better than the IRR right at the end of it we will we'll kind of collate all sorts of uh, positives and negatives around NPV and IRR and we will probably realize that NPV is better than the IRR but in real life firms tend to use IRR if there is capital rationing 
and they're trying to kind of make more money out of the same amount of money right now remember that NPV is an absolute metric it gives us a rupee value absolute value how much rupees do you generate by taking a project we can however convert it to a relative measure by using what is called as a profitability index now what is a profitability index you take the NPV and you divide it by your initial capital outlay how much money did you put in the project and how much money did you make out of the project is what gets defined here correct so practically speaking in project in the first case your profitability index will be 478162 divided by 1 million so 478162 divided by 1 million is going to give me 47.8 percent in the second case i'm going to divide 2011673 by 10 million and i'm going to get 20 percent right so practically for the amount of money invested if i invest 100 rupees in project a i get 47 rupees back if i invest 100 rupees in project b i get 20 rupees back so if I use what is called as the profitability index, I can successfully convert what was an absolute metric into a, uh, a relative measure in terms of something that tells me about a percentage return that should be taken. So if I have uh, a choice to make in terms of which project gives me more, more value for my money invested, I will opt for project A because it generates more value per rupee invested into it right and assuming these are ex mutually exclusive projects right then there are some other assumptions that go into the entire scenario right remember if we go back to our bond analysis when we were calculating the yield for a bond we assume that the cash flows are reinvested at the yield to maturity right do we remember this so for example if there is a bond that gives me 10 and 110 what is the return over two years one year and two year what is the return here we are saying 10 percent return another bond gives us 121 after two years only 121 after two years what is the return here that's also 10 percent now that can only happen this can only be equal to this if this 10 that we got at the end of the first year got reinvested at 10 percent to give us one more next year so 10 plus 110 plus 1 and that's 121 so that's the inherent assumption whenever you use a formula like IRR the cash flows that come out it's assumed that the cash flows are getting reinvested at the IRR when you're using NPV remember you are discounting it at the hurdle rate or the discount rate or the cost of capital so NPV assumes that the, the cash flows are reinvested at cost of capital or hurdle rate. Now in real life, the IRR assumption is a bit difficult to sustain. Why is because if the IRR is 30%, that does not mean that if you're getting a cash flow of 100 rupees, that's going to get invested at 30% in real life. That's not possible a lot of the times, right? If the cost of capital is 12%, that possibly can still happen that you get 100 rupees in a cash flow and that gets reinvested at 12% in real life because that's what you're borrowing money at, correct? So effectively, the IRR has a problem that it will end up overstating the return on the project, especially if the IRR is high. So if the IRR is high, like in our previous example, the IRR was 32%, it would assume that all cash flows for this particular project A are getting reinvested at 32%, which means when you get a cash flow, you're effectively putting that money back into the same project or another project that gives you 32%. Now that may not happen in real life. So logically, the IRR tends to overstate the returns on the project, all other things being equal. That's where the NPV scores over the IRR once again, right? So that's an unrealistic kind of an assumption that goes into the IRR. And then, you know, if we are comparing projects with different lives, 
it becomes difficult to compare them using NPV because NPV of projects is expected to be higher when the long the lives are longer than that of shorter life projects. So if there is a four year project and there is a 10 year project, it's expected that the NPV would be higher for the 10 year project. So you can't really compare these two because if they are mutually exclusive, you will miss the point that in the context of the four year project, there is a possibility that after four years, another project comes in where you can reinvest the money, right? That's not necessarily true with, uh, with uh, you know, so in real life, it becomes difficult to kind of compare these two projects. We can use the IRR, but the issues that IRR comes with continue here as well. But in these kind of cases, probably IRR scores are a little better even though the reinvestment issue sticks with respect to the IRR question, right? So you have to be careful while using and comparing projects with different lives. It is a difficult task to compare projects with different lives using purely NPV because the timing of the cash flows and the fact that in, in a longer cash flow timeline series, the NPV is expected to be higher. That's possibly going to impact our decision making when choosing the NPV rule here. So we probably shouldn't be using NPV rules if the lives are different for projects. Tenures are different for projects, right? And finally, another way of dealing with uncertainty. Now remember, all our assumptions are full of uncertainties. So a lot of the times firms may want to find a way that defines how quickly they get their money back. This period is called as payback period. Basically, how much time does it take in year terms to get your money back? So you invest 1 million. Now look at these two projects, project A and project B. You find that the NPV of project B is higher than project A. So based on NPV, you should be choosing project B. But given the uncertainties in real life, you also want money back faster, right? Now look at when does the capital come? You put in 1 million. You get 350,000, 450,000, that's 800,000. Somewhere in the middle of year two and three, you will recover your 1 million invested, your 10 lakh rupees invested. In the second case, you get 350,000 plus 150, that's 500,000 and 250,000, that's 750. So somewhere in the middle of year three and four is where you will get your money back. So if I'm looking at year end periods, then in the first case, my payback period is about three years. In the second case, it is four years. Given that the NPV is not materially different, I would want to choose a project which gives me my money back faster. So the smaller the payback period, the lesser uncertainty I have to deal with, right? Less uncertainty. So in real life, sometimes firms also use what is called as the payback period. Faster you get your money, faster the money is free to get reinvested, faster you can take up more projects in real life. And in an environment where you have to choose projects where depending on the, depending on the availability of capital that you have, that's a very, very big uh, point to consider as to when does my cash get released, right? So that's where the buyback period, payback period becomes important from the perspective of analyzing companies. So if we summarize this now, basically we are saying that smaller firms use IRR, but in almost all other cases. So that's one place where IRR gets used. The other is projects with different lives, projects with different lives here you use IRR in almost all other cases NPV better than IRR and what are the reasons there could be multiple IRRs that's a problem sometimes there is a reinvestment problem IRR assumes that reinvestment is happening at a certain rate and uh, that may not happen in real life hence IRR kind of tends to overstate the the potential return from a project and IRR is useful only when there is capital rationing for larger firms if there is no capital rationing then you're better off using NPV as a rule to evaluate projects right so that's broadly the loose ends that we had to tie 
as we come to the end of this particular section a few quick questions that we want to kind of look at what kind of companies are likely to use the IRR rule for evaluating projects what do we mean by payback period and how can we convert NPV into a relative metric thank you